So I go to I go into the slideshow. All right, I want to talk today about scrolls. Uh, first, just about scrolls in general, and then come to the uh, level two grill. Uh, I start with some background scrolls are little math, not much. Uh, go to the ribbon and fishtail family of scrolls, uh, show you how to make a scroll jig, and then the snub end and the bevel scrolls, and then some tips and tricks uh, at the end. What are scrolls? Scrolls are these curly things, and they are inspired by nature. I just need to do some adjustment here on my screen because I, all right. Uh, these ferns, for instance, they, they are pretty much exactly what, what the squalls are. And there's some, some squalls in the animal worlds too, some snails or snail houses and all kinds of nature things that are squalls. What a scroll basically is, it's kind of a blob or leaf at the end, and then a curl around uh, that spirals outward. Mathematically, those scrolls are called spirals. Uh, here's a nice book, Art Forms in the Plant World. It has a number of beautiful pictures about uh, uh, plants and animals uh, that could, can inspire all kinds of metal work too. Uh, this one is a scroll from a fern. Uh, what we are looking at is scrolls that uh, open up more and more as further you come to, when you come further to the outside, and they mathematically, they are called logarithmic spirals. And they come in different pitches and the pitch means uh, how fast they open up. Uh, there's a lot of talk about the Fibonacci spiral. It's not exactly the spiral uh, as blacksmith typically use, but I, I want to explain what it is anyway. Uh, so, so you know what it is. It's related to the gold mean. It's another term you probably have heard of. Here is the whole Fibonacci deal. Uh, uh, it bases on the Fibonacci series. You start with one, one, and then you go on the series by just adding the two numbers before. One and one is two, one and two, three, two and three is five, three and five is eight, and so on and so on. The golden mean, that's the ratio of two consecutive numbers. Uh, one divided by two is a half. And then as you go up the line, 21 divided by 34 is 0 0.62. And if you go further, it stays at 0 0.62. It converges, it's what, what mathematicians would say. And this 0 0.62, that's, that's called the golden mean. Uh, you can uh, use, uh, you can go on a piece of paper and, and draw uh, this golden mean spiral in a way that's shown here on the uh, on the slide on this part here uh, by just making these little squares a two square a three square a five square an eight square and so on and then draw the spiral in from this picture you all you see uh, this is opening up very fast uh, much faster than what usually natural spirals, natural uh, scrolls do, and, and what we usually use, but at least you know now what it is. So how do we draw spirals that, op that don't open up that fast? There's an easy way to do that. Uh, another piece of paper, uh, you draw four lines that intersect You choose a point on one line, and I chose 
a point that's half inch from the center, but it doesn't really matter. You can choose whatever you want. I just thought smaller than one half, it's useless for a blacksmith. Uh, so I started at one half. Uh, then you cut a piece of cardboard at 80 degrees. Uh, you don't need to do 80 degrees, uh, but 80 degrees uh, leads to the spirals that we are after. I, I tried a couple different angles, 70 and 90, and, and 80 seems to be about what we have on the level two grill. So then I take that piece of cardboard, I put it on the paper, have my starting dot, and then I draw a line uh, to the next beam that starts from the center out. And I go all the way around. I draw this one, this one, this one, always connect where the other stops, always use the 80. And going on here, I get a spiral uh, that's pretty much the spiral that we have on the level two grill. Uh, feel free to try other angles. Uh, the golden spiral is somewhere between 80 and 85 degrees. Uh, I put 85 here in, in, in red, then it opens faster. If all of that is too complicated because you say I'm not a mathematician, I'm just a blacksmith, uh, here is an easy rule of thumb that I use. Practic let, that's called the practical approach. You draw a scroll freehand. Uh, some people are able to draw it better, others less good. Uh, after if you've drawn a couple, then you probably get pretty good at it. Uh, and then you go with the positive and the negative space. I don't know if this is exactly what it is. I've heard so much talk about positive and negative space. Uh, this is my interpretation of it. I call this where the meat is of the spiral, the positive space. And this, which is mostly open, the negative space, and the spirals uh, in the grill, and most of the spirals that I do, they're about half-half. Uh, half is the positive, and half is the negative space. Uh, once you've drawn your uh, spiral and, and put the ruler to it, and it's not exactly half-half, then you can make adjustments. and uh, then smoothen any kinks out that you have in your drawing and should, you should be pretty good to go. So and here, here comes the clue of the whole thing. Uh, if you go in a different direction, uh, it's still half-half and you can go all the way around and it's always half-half. And you can draw the spiral here bigger on and, and it stays half and half. Uh, you could also apply the gold mean here. Uh, then you don't go half half. You go 0.62. Oh, let's let's make that two third, two third, one third, and it still is a nice looking spiral. But it's not the same spiral that's called the gold mean spiral uh, that I have showed you before. This is a different thing. Now. When did blacksmiths start making scrolls? That's centuries ago. Uh, I was lucky and found a reprint of a very old book uh, published first in 1767 in Paris. And it shows scrolls that pretty much look like our scrolls. It looks scroll jigs that pretty much looked like what we what we do today for scroll jigs and it has scrolling forks look pretty much like we do today so not much changed there let's have a further look this this guy here on the right side he uses a scroll jig and, and makes a scroll uh, on that Drawing the scroll doesn't look very nice, but whatever his architect told him, that's probably what he did. And on the same page than, than this guy here, I found 
this picture up on the left here. And uh, I don't know if they call that a level two grill, but it looks awfully close to what we call a level two grill. All right, so much for the, for the background and for the theory. Uh, I have a picture here, five different scrolls uh, that are in our grill. There are four in there, right? So you pick which four you do on your level two grill. And I will go through all these scrolls and, and show you how, how to make them uh, in theory and then with a little video for each. The easiest one is the ribbon scroll. It's just a piece of flat bar that's tapered in one dimension and then scrolled in to fit uh, the drawing. Uh, before we can make something fit the drawing, we need to uh, transfer our drawing on a piece of metal. Uh, you can do it on a piece of paper, but chances are that you burn up the paper pretty fast. Uh, the way I do uh, the transfer, and there's other ways, and in some part of this uh, class, uh, you probably learn other ways to do this. Uh, I just uh, take some duct tape and I uh, tape my piece of paper, my drawing, to an old piece of sheet metal. And then I take the center punch and, and punch along the lines. Uh, and when I have the center punch marks on my piece of metal, then I take a Sharpie and make it all black. And if I burn the black off, I still have the center punch marks so I can uh, get the lines back on if I need to. Uh, that drawing, by the way, it is uh, in the, uh, Abana's Hammers Blow, summer 2022, and it's also on Abana's website. Now, how do we do uh, the, the scroll, the ribbon scroll? Uh, you start tapering the end uh, for, the, for the level two project. Uh, we have a, a quarter by three quarter flat bar. Uh, taper that, uh, if I remember right, about uh, uh, three inches long uh, to a point that's maybe a sixteenth uh, thick, and we keep the width uh, constant at three quarter. I first start uh, on the back on the uh, far side of the anvil. Uh, get the tip bent down with brushing strokes. You will see that in the video nicely. And then once I'm down about say 90 degrees, I turn it around and then blow back uh, onto it. Uh, that's, that's here on the upper right. And then uh, when I got the, the tip uh, about in the right shape, then I go to a or this little U-shaped thing that I uh, had used here. And there's a couple other uh, ways to do this. And we scroll it around uh, in between, always put it on the, on the sheet metal with a drawing and make sure that it all fits at the end. Uh, when you go, make sure that you get the tip exactly first before you go on. Always do a little little bit at the time and don't go too fast. Uh, for the ribbon scroll, it's not too difficult to, to uh, uh, correct the middle, but for the more complicated scrolls, once you've done the, uh, the center part wrong and you scroll too far, uh, then you can't usually get there anymore with a, with a hammer and to correct it. Uh, so it's a good habit to to make sure that you go from the center point and and make sure everything is correct and then go step by step further to the outside. I do here. 
should be a, oh, this is my video. All right. So I narrow from the sides first before I taper, because if I taper and I get the thing too thin and too wide, it's very hard to hammer that back without folding, folding over in itself. I do the tapering on the horn. You don't need to do it on the horn, but it's faster on the horn than, than on the flap of the anvil. This is the rough shape. And then I, I correct it and flatten the flat side of the anvil. Chamfer the edges a little bit. Don't need to do it, but I, for me, it looks better at the end if the if the edges of of the spool are tapered. There's brushing strokes, and then I turn it around. That wasn't enough. And then I turn it around and hammer back in itself. It takes a little bit of practice. Uh, to, to get the shape right in the first go, but after you've done a couple, it's get, it gets pretty fast. Don't get frustrated if you do your first scroll and, and you bend it back and forth seven times. Uh, it happens to everybody, but then after a while, it, it's almost automatic and, and you get it right. Uh, I don't I didn't do the whole scroll in this video. I think for one of the other scrolls, I, I did the whole process. I didn't want to bore you here and, and do the same thing over and over and over again. So I focused on a different part of the of the of the scroll every time as we go uh, through the different types of scrolls. Here's a couple uh, examples of easy ribbon scrolls with different pitches. Uh, these are actually pictures that I did uh, along the road in the little town in northern Germany where I grew up. Uh, these are about from the 1900 to 1910s. Uh, they're not all very artistic, but there's thousands of them as you go along the road. Okay, here is our first ribbon scroll all done. Uh, what I uh, want to point out here is uh, I usually measure the piece uh, of stock that I have, the length of it, before I do anything so that I know at the end how much material it took to make something. This will be important when you go and do another scroll on the upper end here, and the whole thing needs to fit the drawing. So I marked the center mark here. It's the center, the middle of the grill uh, on the side. And uh, it took me 14 and three quarter uh, inches of parent stock. Uh, what we will do next is we will use this first scroll that we made and make a uh, make a master. Or we, we sorry, we, we use it as a master to make a scroll jig. Scroll jig, here's a couple. Uh, I have a uh, drawing here of that old thing uh, in that old book. Uh, we can make a scroll jig out of a quarter inch material and weld it to a piece of angle iron that we can clamp in the vise. Uh, if we don't want to uh, weld, uh, then we need to use a little thicker material. Uh, what I will show you is, is a, uh, a scroll jigs made out of uh, three eighths by three quarter. 
as you can see here, it is flared a little bit at the end. Otherwise, you can't get the start done. Uh, so that's the first thing we have to do. Let's see here. So I draw out the three eighths by one or by one I used. Sorry, I, I said three quarter. Uh, draw it out sideways to be about an inch and a half wide uh, and offset it. Uh, this side is straight and the other is a little curved. When I scroll that, that scroll of course needs to be a little smaller than the uh, scroll that I wanna make. And then I continue using my bending fork or my little bending jig and I get it to approximately the shape, and then I finish it by hammering it into my master scroll. Show you that in the video. Uh, what does it do here? here? We are. So the pin of the hammer and widen the end. I play this a little later, not to, to bore you too much. Uh, you get the point from this, even if it's still running a little, little fast. I marked the one and a half there, so it wasn't quite there. then flatten it. It was a little easier to, to flatten on the, on the horn. Then make one side straight and here we are. Then that's to be scrolled in. That's the same process that we used before. It's just a little thicker and wider material. And I look at my master, it's not quite tight enough yet. So get that a little more. And that looks better now. And then I'll go on and use my bending tool. And I can be quite a bit off and the whole thing would still work. As long as this fits inside, somehow inside, it will work. When I, the first time I did this, I, I was really surprised that it would work. So here's my, my scroll form. I fit that in there, bend it down that it's as close as it gets to the form and then just hammer it in from the from the end it it fits snug in and if you be careful that it's not in there for too long that it heats up your master scroll uh, it will not bend the thinner outside i had a little air gap there so I used my bending fork to get that in there and then hammer a little more and here's my scroll jig. I show you one more scroll. And uh, after that, I pause a little bit and take your questions. Uh, you probably know that you can post questions in the, in the chat line in between. So we have them uh, for that question and answer pause. Uh, the fishtail scroll is pretty much the same than the uh, than the ribbon scroll, except uh, that the taper uh, is in one dimension and then it's spread out uh, widthwise, pretty much like we did the scroll jig. So, uh, except this is not offset; this is uh, symmetric to both sides. Uh, draw it out sideways with a hammer pin, uh, or spread it and then flatten on the face of the anvil. 
And let's see how it's done here. We've seen this before. Now you know why I, why I played it a little faster to not to be too repetitive. This is good exercise. Uh, when you hit the anvil a couple of times, so uh, start slowly until you until you get the rhythm, and then you can go faster and and hit heavier. I do about an inch and a half or two on the width, and then the whole thing, the whole taper and spread is about three inches long. I go here, start my scroll, same thing, brushing blows, get the tip to the right shape. Scroll jig this time, just to show you something else. Here's my scroll jig uh, in the vise. The third part is looking up. You see now why it needs to be fair, otherwise it wouldn't fit. And I use a, a pair of tongs to hold the end in place, otherwise it would just slide around. That's part of it. And as you can see, this is much this is much quicker than uh, what we tried to do freehand before. It's two heats and you got the whole scroll done. Sorry, that uh, takes another one. I didn't show you the, don't show you the last heat and it's supposed to be about symmetric, but you can correct that at uh -oh. any time. Oh, here's the last feed. All right, that's the fishtail scroll. And I stop this here. Uh, if there's any questions, I'm happy to take them now. Everybody feel free to unmute and pop on if anything comes up. Anybody? The old left. No, no, it's you're just being very clear <laughs> and concise and not leaving any room for questions. It's almost surprising. all right. Okay. No, we can we can uh, we can do the questions at the end. No big deal. All right, and the chat is always available, people. Okay, uh, I go on then. All right. Oops. Doesn't want to go on. Here we are. Here's some examples. Uh, old pieces with uh, fishtail scrolls. Uh, What's done very often with fishtail scrolls is that uh, that there is uh, some notches uh, hammered in, and sometimes the end is split up to really make them very wide. That you see that in, in all pieces uh, a lot of times. Here, here's another one that's split up on the bottom of this uh, column here. All right, we get to the solid end uh, or snub end scrolls. And we have two in the program. One is the half penny and the other is a solid snub end. Uh, the half penny scroll is uh, not as wide as the parent stock. Uh, it's created by twisting the snub and uh, that gives you the possibility to make a bigger snub, a larger diameter snub on the end without having to weld anything on. Here's a progression on 
how the half penny is made. Uh, you start with a Hearn stock, uh, which is uh, three quarter inch wide and quarter inch thick for level two projects. Uh, mark off a square. So that means uh, three quarter from the end. Then you go to the far side of the anvil. The, the edge of the anvil will be in the bottom here. And uh, narrow this, neck this in here. Uh, taper back about three inches. And then twist the end. So now you got this uh, this thinner, but more uh, surface area uh, mass that you can round up to make the snub end. Uh, the next step after twisting is you you uh, smoothen out the twist. Uh, you don't need to do it all the way, but just just roughly at this point. Uh, then the let's say the upper end and the or the outside. The outside is rounded and the inside is rounded. Uh, and I'll show you a little later how that's done. And you get to a kind of a teardrop shape. Uh, you, you leave this alone uh, until the outsides, lower side and the outer side are uh, nice and, and round. And in between, you have always to correct for mushrooming. You can see uh, this is a little thicker here, and this is thicker too. You have to do that as you go, because it's very hard uh, once the mushrooming is too far uh, then it's hard to get back without uh, messing up the whole the whole nice shape. Uh, once the uh, once you've done that, uh, then you go and take the teardrop out by by hammering against your hand and little from the upside until it's nice and round. When you're there. You go like we did before. You start rounding it. Uh, you turn it around, round more. Uh, make sure for this kind of scroll that you correct as you go because it's very hard uh, once once you're halfway around with your scroll to get to the little snub end and, and correct that. Uh, some people use a scrolling jig like this uh, because it gets right in the corner here. Uh, I, I made one when I started with squalls, but for some reason I don't use it anymore. It, for me, it feels much easier to do over the far end of the anvil and correct it. I, I, I don't have use for that anymore, but it might be that that for you, it's, it's a good thing to do. Everybody does things a little differently. And again, after you're about this far, and you have made sure that the part maybe until here is exactly then then it's supposed to be on your on your drawing. Then you go to a scrolling jig and or or the bending fork and uh, and continue. Show you this in a little video too. your neck in that you have about a three quarter by three quarter uh, end snap there. Uh, as you go, you, you get back to the uh, quarter inch thickness. It, if there's a little bulge left, that doesn't matter, but, but most of it uh, taken out as you, as you go along. Don't let it bulge too much, then, then you get some folding going on if you flatten it, then here we are. Taper it back about three uh, inches. Do a little more. Take the hammer blows out as good as you can. 
little little chamfering. What you can see here is uh, uh, I use a, uh, a place on my anvil where the where the uh, the edge is nice and round. I got a pretty sharp radius here and and a wider radius there. I use the wider. Uh, otherwise, it's easy to get a cold shut in here once when you when you start curling it in. So don't make it too sharp. Twist the end around. And I clean out that that twist just roughly, not not all the way, but just that it's about square again. Chamfer the edges a little bit. And now I go, it's, I make my, my teardrop next. Oh, the far end, start with that outer corner, knock that down, get the bulge out, get it back to quarter inch thickness. Turn it around, do the same with the inner edge that's a little more difficult go back and forth until you're happy with this is the hallway of the Venetian this is about I, stood I could do a little bit more on the inside but it, uh, there was just tons of people coming up front yeah It's, uh, it's pretty wild being recognized like that just at a show like this in Vegas. So um, walking the show at the park. Uh... Okay. Now I get it to round. Correct a little bit. Okay, that's about when I all right. When you start curling this in, it, it has a tendency to make a kink right right where the uh, the snub end ends. And it takes a little bit of practice to get that kink out, but it's important to get it out before you scroll too much. Uh, once you scroll too much, then it's hard to do. So take take that time, if necessary, put another heat in to get that that transition from the snub end to the main bar, nice and smooth and without any kinks. I just made a small uh, piece of sheet metal here so that I didn't have to walk around from the anvil to the table and back and forth. Uh, that way I could get more out of, of, out of my heat. Yeah, and then for the video, I had my scrolling jig in, a, in, a, in the hardy hole. So I had everything in the same view but could easily do that in the vice too. And you go piece by piece further to the outside. Need to correct a little kink there. You see the metal is correct. And then I go to the outside. Let's do a little piece. Once you get more practice, you get more of the skull done in one bending.
go on and on. If you have, if you have a whole, whole railing to do with all the same scroll, scrolls, you probably would do, make yourself a scrolling jig that fits the, the snub end. The one that we did wouldn't work for the snub end because it's too long on the inside, and the and the snub end would be in the way. But uh, you can easily make a, a scrolling jig that just goes to here. And then you clamp the snub end in and, and pull it around. But since for the level two grill, you just need one of these, uh, it's not worth the, the effort to do that. Okay. Here we come to the to the last scroll for at least for this session. There's a couple more that you could do, but uh, this is called a solid end or snub end solid scroll and to do that you somehow have to create this extra mass here and you can either do that by welding uh, by flipping the end over and welding it together faggot weld or ribbon weld uh, you make something like the ribbon scroll that we did first and you <coughs> curl it in very tight and uh, then weld that tight end together, or you could upset. Uh, and the upsetting is what we will do here because that's the most easy one. Uh, if you want more mass, uh, then you might have to weld a round piece in. Uh, it's called a bolt and uh, uh, scroll then. Uh, what we here do is uh, the easy thing, uh, just upset the end and curl and don't do any welding. In progression, this is pretty much, uh, this is very simple, no, uh, much like the uh, uh, half penny scroll, but you do the uh, the neck in and, and the thin dimension. You make the neck here, get this to uh, maybe a 16th from a quarter, uh, no, to an eighth from a quarter, and then flip it around to the backside, then hammer from the top, which makes it wider and thicker, and then get this end here round, uh, following the same steps than we did before. Uh, taper back two to three inches here in between. Uh, when you uh, do the upsetting, make sure that this angle is uh, less than 90 degrees. Uh, this is a little too far already. We can see that in the in the uh, in the video very good. I, I hammer this back and open it up a couple of times uh, to not have them have it less than ninety. Once we have the square, we get to the teardrop. From the teardrop, we get to round, then scroll it in and scroll it all the way in. Uh, as we go progress through the different steps, uh, make sure that the width is corrected back, uh, that it's not getting wider than, uh, than the three uh, quarter of the parent stock. Uh, for the uh, rounding the snub, uh, same than we've seen before, start on the outer edge, get this edge round, turn it around, get the inner edge round. Once you have the teardrop, uh, then get the teardrop to round. And then you curl it in, uh, first on the anvil, and then with a bending fork or a combination of a scrolling jig or bending fork. What I did here is I have one scrolling fork that I clamped on the anvil and use the second one on the outside. 
show you that in the video too. When you get started here, uh, this is a little harder to do uh, than what we've seen for the half penny. Uh, make sure that you uh, don't pull too much on this this end here. It's it's very easy to uh, before you have a real notch here, real positive uh, resistance uh, to uh, shift it back and forth, and and you get a multi-step. Uh, notch there and that's very hard to correct then you probably have to go and do it again so i i do a couple single blows to get it started until i have a, a positive resistance on that edge and when i do the the tapering back uh, i keep the i keep the notch a little bit outside to avoid hitting and cutting another another step in there. Sometimes you get off sideways too. You can see here that the one side is a little longer than the other, uh, but you can correct that too before you make sure that the width is taken back mm -hmm. in between. Don't make it too thin. Uh, go to half the width to an eighth, but not less than than an eighth. If it's a little more, it's fine. But if it's if it's less, then uh, you might get in trouble when you start uh, making the stuff. Flip that over. See, I have ninety degrees now. I open it up again a little bit. And then I compress this whole thing in itself. In theory, that should be very difficult, but it's actually very easy to do. And round the outer side, and then flip it over around the inner side. Again, like before, the inner side is a little more difficult to do. Here's my teardrop, and then I go, call it in a little bit, and get thin out. Here is the round. Go to the far side, brushing strokes, call the whole thing in. Make sure that this initial kink where the transition is, is taken out. I don't show you the whole thing because we've seen how this is curled many times now. Um, instead, I, I give you a couple pictures uh, of, of situations uh, that are not exactly what you want to have and how you correct them. Uh, here's my snub and scroll. And I see it's not curled in enough. Uh, at the center, what you can do is uh, put it on the horn of the anvil. Uh, my anvil has this nice shelf that works even better for that. But if you don't have a shelf, you can use the horn of the anvil or clamp something in your vise that's sticking out and hammer it from the top. And this will go in and it will be uh, fitting better. Here is a situation where there is a kink in here. Take out what I do is I use a bending tool. Uh, this is my bending fork that's clamped in a vise. 
and where the kink is, I have that kink in the middle between the two tines, and then hammer from the outside that will take the kink out. Of course, all this is, is done hot. I just made the pictures here cold because that's easier to take pictures to show you how it's done. Uh, then there might be situations where you have kind of quite quite a complex uh, deviation like like here uh, that you want to correct. And what you can do is you since you your drawing is is a piece of sheet metal, uh, get the thing hot. Uh, over the whole stretch where you want to correct and go on it with two bending forks and and get this corrected or in this case turn this in more on the outside that works pretty good at least for me my last picture no it's not the last picture I show you some some examples of uh, snap and scrolls here, uh, some old things, old grills, and some finicky scrolls here. They they made very big scrolls, probably uh, uh, made ribbon scrolls, curled them in, and then forged them uh, together to to make one big bulb in the middle. And then this is a more modern thing here. Frank, is this all work in Germany? Uh, uh, some of it is, yeah. I know. This is my my loft here, my my uh, front porch. That's in Montana. Yeah, this I don't know where I got it. Uh, this was taken in Germany. This, yeah, this too. Yeah, that's in the uh, city hall in Hamburg. All right. Last scroll for today, and probably the most difficult one of the series that we did. Uh, the end is tapered, and then it's beveled to have kind of like a trapezoid uh, uh, cross section. And of course, at the end, it's a smaller, of the same shape. And it's not as scrolled, but it's twisted at the same time. And that's a little tricky. Progression of what you do to create that. Start with your flat bar, same material than before. Uh, make a short taper. I think it's about two inches long what I did. And I did a little rounded taper. It's not a straight taper, but you can do what, what you think looks good for your eye. Uh, then it's uh, curled in uh, the hard way. You start making the, uh, the bevel on the inside using a, a small diameter uh, rounding hammer. You start on the inside, uh, it opens up a little bit. And that's good because you can hammer it better and more precise with your uh, rounding hammer. And when you go on the outside to do the, do the outside taper, it curls in again and you, you end up with what you started with. Uh, sometimes you have to go back and forth a couple times. I, I, what I usually do is when I start on the first side, I don't go all the way to the middle. Uh, that way I avoid to go too far. And then I go on the outside and taper it. And then I have two lines here and a little flat in the middle. And then I can work it from the inside and the outside until the two lines match. And, and that works pretty good for me. Uh, this actually on the picture looks like I didn't do a very good job on the outside here. That probably takes an heat to smoothen this out here. I can still see my, my uh, marks from the, from the rounding hammer. And the whole thing is curled in in two dimensions.
here's the whole thing. Again, step by step, create the one sided taper, uh, curl it over the straight side, curl it in, up this picture. Uh, it might need several tries. If, if you work to match a drawing, uh, you do a taper like this, mm -hmm. do a, a scrolling end like this. And what I do is I just take a piece of chalk and, and make a drawing of this uh, on my table. And then I go on until I have my scroll. And if this scroll is too small or too big or too whatever, uh, then I know I have to start differently. Uh, it took me uh, two trials. The first one I hadn't curled in enough, and so I couldn't get the right shape. Uh, this this is what what works. So if it's pointing about back to the parent stock, about two hundred seventy degrees. For the for the level two thing that's on the drawing, uh, you bevel the side first, then the outside, and then go back and forth uh, until it's a nice line in the middle. And then you do that compound bend. Uh, you can do that over the horn of the anvil. Uh, my horn is pretty thick, so it doesn't work. So I, I made myself a little uh, smaller horn for my vice uh, where I did the, uh, the compound bending and then I correct it with bending forks until it's the shape I want. Last little video. the initial taper about two inches long leave it a little rounded get the thickness back to the parent stock This is about the shape that I went with. Then I go over the horn. Realized that my my anvil was my anvil stand is a little rocky, but it it worked for this video. Hammer this around and then get around on the other side and get it curled in a little more. And then do some more freehand. I went to 270 degrees about here. This was my chalk mark drawing. That's about where I want it. I start with rounding hammer on the inside to bevel, start at the tip, and then go to the other side and go a couple times until it's about the the edge, the is about the middle of the of the bar, not quite the middle, but about and then I do the next pass on the outside. I use the, the bigger rounding hammer on the outside. With the small one, you get a lot of pock marks there. Of course, you can take them out in the second goal, but 
you can see that here, let me stop this. No, no, you can't see it. I stop it again a little bit, a little later. That I, that my two lines don't meet yet in the middle. I, I got the meat here, the inner line and the outer line almost meet, but not quite. So I have to go back here and push this inner line further outside to, to get to the middle. And then I need to work a little bit here on the outside and on the inside to make these two lines meet. Uh, at the end, the most important is that you, that you, get a nice peak here where it's exactly in the middle. Uh, this is not visible as much, but but the but the very tip is very visible at the end and it looks nice or it doesn't look nice. So I'll keep this up again and, and do another round on both sides. I clean the uh, scale off nice uh, because if you hammer the scale in there, it doesn't look nice either because you don't see that clean line in the middle that that well. Yeah, we are. So here's my little beak, my horn. I start at the middle. Uh, it's a pretty small hammer because it doesn't take much. And I, I try to not hit the middle line. I try to always hammer on the outside. Uh, some, some people uh, use a rawhide this. Uh, for me, that doesn't feel right. So I, I'm, I. For me, it works better with with a small hammer. But but that's uh, preference. You you do what uh, what feels good to you. Then you can use a bending fork, and correct things. Uh, I've seen. Smith doing this just in one go over the pick of the anvil and it all is exactly the shape that you want to go, but I never managed to do that. So I do a lot with my bending fork. With a bending fork, if you use one, uh, again, you have to make sure that you don't bend over the uh, middle line. Don't squeeze that, then you get marks in there and they, you, you can't get them out again. So I try to have just contact of my bending fork, either on one side of the bevel or on the other side of the bevel, but not on the middle line. This is almost there, I would think. Yeah, here we are with that scroll. Uh, seems like I wasn't happy with that yet. I did one more go. There we go. All right. Now we have four different scrolls. Uh, we haven't made the pieces for the grill yet ourselves to do the scrolls and make them fit to the drawing. These scrolls, of course, that's not all there is out in the world. And I show you a couple more pictures of other scrolls. Uh, 
scrolls that all fit nicely and have the same size, not just four on a, on one grill, but this this grill here was about, uh, I would say, 16 foot wide and uh, nine foot high. And I didn't count the scrolls, but somebody had quite a bit to do to all the, do all those. And then this was a big chandelier with scrolls that go uh, uh, three times around. And uh, there's a fishtail and uh, there's a snub end and there's some curled scrolls uh, other than the one we did, a little more sophisticated ones. So this was just the, the beginning of learning to make scrolls. And I hope you have fun uh, going on and doing your own scrolls. Now I'm back for questions. Frank, that has to be the most efficient bending fork I've ever seen. <laughs> that makes so much sense. I don't know why I've been pushing things apart the way the way they teach it in CBA. <laughs> That's brilliant. I don't know. I don't know. I, I I don't know how many bending forks I have. I have plenty of them. Um, questions, anybody? There is something in the chat. Let's see. That's like, just me. That's no. just me. Simping on your bending fork. It's really cool. On that um, penny scroll, make after, after you set the shoulder, and before you do the twist. Yeah. Uh, you dress the you dress the edges a little bit, but um, you don't go in and really like heavily chamfer right around where you do that twist to make it easier. Once no, twist, have no I, I, I don't do that. I, maybe you can. I, I haven't tried it, but okay. it works pretty good for me this, this way. And, and that, that twist is uh, almost invisible uh, once you're done. Okay. Yeah, you have to make sure that you don't work that, that uh, weak part uh, too much uh, because then you get kinks or even cold shuts. So leave right. it a little thicker and a little uh, rougher until you're okay. all done. Okay. Uh, that works better for me. Great, thank you. Anybody else? This is all filmed in your shop, correct, Frank? Yeah, that was done in my shop, yeah. Hmm? Good camera angles, very clear. The lighting is excellent, especially I, on the bevel. I, I tell my wife she takes the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, if anybody out, nobody else has any questions, John, are you ready to get started on your section, the coloring? Yep, I'm ready to go. All righty. Um, same thing, just mute your mics and turn off your videos and uh, we'll get started. Let's see if my <laughs> camera focuses. I guess it doesn't matter if my face is blurry. On, uh, I think it was Greg just asked the question. And when I do my half penny scrolls, I usually do chamfer my corners. Um, and I'll set it down, you know, say it's like quarter by three quarter. And then I set that shoulder down, it will usually um, gain some width. So it'll become about about three eighths by three eighths square. And then I keep that extra width in there. And then I hammer my corners down to have good strong chamfers. And I twist it at that point. And then it's really, really easy. If you're having a hard time getting those twists to go away, that's a good way to um, to do that. So I thought that was a good question and um, I do it that way um, routinely. So that might help you if you're having a hard time. Anyway, I'll get on with my um, presentation here. You have the share? Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, I'm gonna be doing collaring. I'm gonna cover the three collars that are um, shown in the frame here. Um, this is all um, in Mark Asprey's book, his third book, um, that's volume um, three is the red one. And uh, it's all in chapter um, 16 on page 333. So it's a real great st study guide for all of this. And I try to stay consistent in my talks so that you guys can reference that. Um, and you don't need to take as many notes and you don't try to have to remember um, as much of, of uh, what I present. 
Let me uh, grab a pointer. Okay, so, and let me move some bars around. There we go. Now I can read what I said. Okay, so materials and two tools. You're going to need um, a hand hammer, a, uh, a leather mallet is um, helpful. You could use a wood mallet too, but I, I like uh, rawhide. Um, set hammers are um, handy, not totally necessary, but they definitely, um, definitely help, especially when closing your collar. I like the mallet for when I close my collar, if I have any, um, if I have any uh, sort of decoration on there and sizing beads, anything like that, it kind of protects your collar from getting dinged up when you're doing your closures. Um, I would advise you to do some collaring jigs and vices. You don't necessarily need them, but it definitely makes things a lot, um, a lot easier. And um, I would, I would try to do these things more than just the single application of the level two grill. I would try to do these until you feel comfortable with them. Um, a lot of people will do these only as many times as they need to, but then they always feel uncomfortable about performing when they, when they have to, even though they have experience. So I just try to do things where I just feel entirely comfortable with the process. Um, and if you're going to do that, then having the jigs and everything, it's, it's well worth the time spent doing if you're going to do a lot. Um, bending jigs for, um, uh, for samples, um, that's optional. And I'll show all of these in, um, in, in my presentation here. Um, tongs for all the size stock that you're going to be using. And this one is just um, 3 16 and um, quarter. But I do have some mandrels that I hold, which are um, 3 quarter, because that's, in, in my presentation, I was using 3 eighths by 3 quarter. So if you're using the, the new and updated Abana, um plans um the stock is uh quarter by three quarter so when you stack that up the mandrel that you would be using would be half by three quarter that's quarter twice by three quarter and um and all of your all of your tooling and everything would have to be adjusted for that so i'll kind of explain how you do all of these things for different collar um, bundles and collar sizes and all of that um, scrolling wrenches are handy they're um, optional but they're handy and uh, these are the stocks that you're going to be the stock that you're going to be using. Three eighths by three quarters is what I used for my my scroll fragments, my my sample fragments, and then the three sixteenths by three quarter and quarter by quarter. That's the actual collar stock itself. Okay, so the the purpose of a of a collar is really decorative. There's probably some additional mechanical benefit to having a collar um, over a junction between scrolls but technically they're not a weight bearing um, structural element. Um, but having said that, um, you know, there's probably a little bit of extra there, but it's not something you wanna rely on. So underneath every collar, you should have a weld if you're doing a, um, if you're using a MIG welder or a rivet, if you're doing it more traditionally, and that's what you get the structure from. And then the, the collar is a closure that goes over that to hide those junctions. And to just really clean things up. Now, in some compositions, they can kind of detract from the, the lines, the silhouettes, the profiles of all of your curvatures for your scrolls and everything. Sometimes it can look a little bit busy when you have collars in there and it kind of breaks up the flow of your, um, of, of your composition. But they can also, having said that they can detract from some um, compositions, they can really enhance and add to others. So it's really a judgment call on, on how you want to put together your designs and how you want to enhance that aesthetic um, value of the designs that you're doing. So when you're measuring for, for collars, I'm, I'm doing three different um, collar types here. The incised collar here and the plain wrapped collar here are the same stock. This stock, because it has upset corners is is going to be out of quarter by three quarter. These two are out of uh, three sixteenths by three quarter. And then you have to decide what kind of closure you wanna do. You can do an overlapped closure, um, which has an angled um, end before you wrap the collar and then they overlap on a, on a slant so that it mates up really nicely and, and closes in, a, in a, uh, a clean closure that way. I understand from talking to Mark Asprey, that's a little bit more of a Germanic um, style. You could do a butted 
closure where the two ends are square and they butt up cleanly against each other. And that, as I understand it, is a little bit more of the English tradition. Um, if you're doing a, an upset corner, then of course you have to have those because you're upsetting the corners, you have to have that end butted. And typically, as I understand it from talking to Mark, um, they generally always try to upset their corners in, in uh, the English tradition. So that might be a reason why most of the collars in, in England are butted is because if you're, if you're doing an upset corner, then you have to have a butted closure. So the basic formula is the perimeter of this, uh, the perimeter of the stock, the total bundle, um, plus the uh, the stock thickness um, times two point five. So, in the case of the the pieces that I was using, I was using three eighths by three quarter. So that takes the the thin edges, and when you stack them twice, it makes it three quarter on all edges. So the total perimeter of this would be. Um, three inches, that's uh, three quarter plus three quarter plus three quarter plus three quarter. And then you can see how on this particular scroll, the edges sort of round out. Now, if you imagine you were looking at just a, the, the, the um, scroll on end, um, it doesn't account for a full, um, say quarter of the, of, of the stock. It looks like if you were to look at it, it's a little bit more of a pie shape or a triangle shape that has to sort of fit into that space. So I find anywhere from um, 2.2 to 2.5, depending on how I'm applying it, tends to be all right. You can start with larger and you can always trim back if it's a little bit too big, but you can't, you can't really stretch these things very well to fill a large gap. So in this case, the, um, the thickness of the sock was 3 16 and you always round down on this this uh, multiple multiplier here. So it's 3 16 times 2.5. Um, double 3 16 would be 3 eighths and then 0.5 would be like 3 30 seconds. You know, um, that's kind of a negligible amount. So it would be maybe what I would call a fat 3 eighths or something like that. So total on these would be three and 3 eighths. And, um, and on this one, you would think it might be different, but since you're forging everything in, you use the same measurement. So it's just larger stock and you use the same measurement. And by the time you upset the corners, it, it ends up about 3 16 inch stock, but it has upset corners. So it ends up working out really, really well. You're gonna make your test pieces, you're gonna make observations, and then you're gonna take good notes. So, you know, the math gets you in the neighborhood of where you need to be. And then after that, then you make a sample. It might be a little bit too uh, too small and it has the gap and then you get, you measure the gap and you add that amount. Could be a little bit too, uh, too big and it wobbles. Um, you can always cut through the closure with a hacksaw and, um, and, uh, and close that up if it's a butted um, closure. And sometimes you can tighten things that way. But generally what you do is you figure out, you know, what kind of loss you have to have to get a good tight closure and then you, make your adjustments and when you're finally satisfied with what your measurement is you just make sure you're really meticulous about always having the same measurement so um butted or overlapped i already talked about that a little bit um, um part of it is uh preference um you know whatever you think is look you know more attractive aesthetically um unless it's a forged collar and then you have to have the this the butted ends um as i already explained um, I already talked a little bit about how some of that's tradition in different regions. Um, forged collars, beaded collars, and overlapped ends are all more challenging than basic butter butted collars. So, you know, your basic is a, just a, a, a plain wrapped collar with butted ends. Um, to do an overlapped end obviously takes a little bit more figuring out. A forged collar takes a little more figuring out, a little bit more effort. And a beaded collar obviously takes more tooling and a little bit more calculating, a little bit more um, skill and proficiency in the application. So what we're asking for um, at Abana, I'm no longer on the board, but I was on the education committee. So I'm um, pretty familiar with what they're asking for there. We're just asking for a, a basic wrapped 
um, plain wrapped collar. And then if you want to do anything above and beyond that, we would direct you towards doing a forged corner or an incised collar if you want to add a little bit of direction or a little bit of ornamentation. Of course, if anything's changed since I've been there, it's been a couple of months, you could always ask Frank. He's still on the education committee and you could get some direction from him. If you wanted to do anything above and beyond, nobody, say you wanted to do a beaded collar like was shown on the old plans, nobody is going to hold that against you, but they're going to judge you to the application of whatever collar you do. So whatever collar you decide, it needs to be applied properly and well. So if you decide that you want to do something more than what's on the plans, um, it's really just a, ch a personal challenge to push your own skill set. So the tooling overview, this is the jig and mandrel. This is the, uh, this is the mandrel. In this case, I was using three eighths inch by three quarter stock doubled. So a piece of three quarter inch square um, as the, the mandrel with just a, a, a striking pad that can be struck and, and deformed a little bit as you drive the collar stock in. These sort of saddle shaped tools, that's your, that's your jig. You can see that there are two here. And um, the reason being is because I'm using two different stock thicknesses. These are, again, they're described in Mark's book. But what you do is you take the total stock thickness. So in this case, it'd be quarter inch plus three eighths plus three eighths plus, plus quarter. You add a piece of card stock, like a cereal box card or a index card, and you add that for thermal expansion. And then that's the, the width that you, that you weld these in. These stops across the back that's just to keep your your uh, your stock square and so you don't get a twist in your collar when you're when you're driving it in having a twist uh, basically twists all of your corners out of square and it makes it very hard to um, get your collar applied properly um, a good little tip I've gotten from Mark Asprey he's to and still does travel a lot for demonstrations is to weld on the inside edge of some um some uh, angle iron and then it's very easy to file that down to fit any hardy hole that you need so i used um this uh angle iron because i was doing this as a demonstration at spring conference um this is uh not a a have to have uh sort of thing but it's a nice to have sort of thing this is the uh, collaring vice you can also fabricate collaring vices this one is forged also in Mark's book, but you can um, you can fabricate them out of angle iron with a spring made out of a piece of flat bar that's welded together, and you can you know you can fabricate various arrangements for that as well. Um, this is a very challenging and fun forging, and it's actually a pretty trick little piece of tooling to have. So you know I I'm kind of a little bit of a tool geek, and I like to do these things. So for me, it's something that I wanted to do because I I just enjoy making these things and having them in my shop. It's uh, specific to whatever, generally sort of specific to um, the size collar that you're doing plus or minus just a small amount because it doesn't open or close um, much beyond what you actually set the, the width at. So um, it, it's, uh, it's more specific for individual collar sizes. It doesn't work in all instances. It's not very handy if you're doing big um, gates where you have to do, you know, like in, in the first place, to do this, you have to put that this this uh, collaring vice into a into an actual vice, and you have to be able to lift the stock that you're you're collaring up on onto uh, the little saddle here and and crank it down. Well, if you're doing a big gate or something like that, that's not practical. So you're generally using a big steel table or something like that for for large applications. So not not good in all applications, but still a real real cool piece of tooling to have. This is a similar type of tooling that you can uh, you can fabricate up. Now, this was this is for a uh, level three um, collar. The this side is for you know for protecting the bead when you bend the collar into a staple um, shape, and then this is for the, actually closing it onto your scroll work. But you don't have to have this you know arrangement for having to protect a bead. You can do something that's basically like this for a flat collar, and and do it for the level two. This just happens to be the one that I have. Um, you're going to make your test elements uh, to uh, to collar. You're going to do a countersink um, on your on your um, your rivet hole so that you can do a flush rivet, and then rivet that all together. 
um, with a flush rivet so that it doesn't have any, it doesn't protrude into the area that's going to be collared. And, um, and then you can make these to test your, these small elements to test to see if your collar is getting applied properly and you have the measurements right and all the rest. To do that, I just use a simple um, scrolling jig. I use a pair of flat um, tongs that it's uh, the width of the jaws is fit to the uh, width of this uh, scrolling jig stock plus the width of the um, of the stock to, to be uh, to be set. So in this case, that would be what quarter plus three eighths. So um, that's uh, five eighths. So, and then you, from there, then you're gonna use a, a scrolling wrench. You're gonna get the whole thing uniformly hot, pin it, switch out for your wrench and, uh, and scroll them around. So here's the video of that. It's a pretty straightforward and basic thing to do, especially after you saw the videos by Frank. If you really want um, things to, to be in the exact position um, of the of the scrolling form that you're using, you want to let you want to clamp them and let them um, cool on the form. But in this case, it's not necessary because it's just a practice element. So you make you know as many of those as you need, obviously, in in pairs. Then you're going to make your you're gonna, I already explained the, um, the measurements for the stock, but I'll reiterate. Um, the stock is the entire perimeter plus the stock thickness, in this case, 3 16 times 2.5, rounded down. Then you're going to take that, you're going to use your mandrel, you're gonna get the whole thing uniformly hot, basically eyeball it from the top, make sure you got an equal amount sticking out on either side of your jig and you're gonna drive it in until it bottoms out. You'll notice that you've got everything is very rounded and it is important to have a chamfer on your mandrel because otherwise it'll cut in. I have more of that a little bit later, but what you'll you'll see is it's not as important for these wrapped collars, but once you get to a, um, a forged collar, it's very critical. So again, um, you know, the spacing of this is the entire bundle of your collar stock plus your scroll stock plus a piece of shim uh, stock out of a card and um, and you can see the the stop here in use you just push everything up against the stop and this stop is a piece of bar that's welded in whole and then you just cut it out that keeps a good alignment and then you drive it in until and now in a perfect world you could see that the amount that's sticking up this side relative to this side is not quite right so I didn't quite eyeball that correctly on this but you know, you practice a few and after a while you get them just right. Then you take, obviously this would be, the, the scroll element would be cool and the collar stock would be hot. And you set the collar stock down in, you set the scroll element in the collar stock, you tighten down so that it, cl the, it closes your little vise. And then you use a rawhide mallet or a set hammer or a combination, whatever works for you in, in a flat, uh, a piece of flat collar like this, you could just use a hammer, but you know, you might want to use something um, to protect any decoration if you do decoration and then you do your closure. And then we'll see a video of that here um, in a second. But first, this is just a, 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 a pictorial um, representation of how you would use the set hammer. You're going to start with it basically, um, you know, in in a common plane with the stock. And as you go, you elevate the struck end so that you're hitting straight down. The set hammer also helps on these flat collar, on the flat collar stock to be able to do a final set and get it snug against this back edge. And here is the um, jig and mandrel. You can see because it had a piece of angle iron, I had to have it off the edge of my vise. I should have put um, a shim over here um, to be able to get a more secure fit. I think a couple of these, it slips a little in the vise. But at any rate, here we go. We get it somewhat centered. Again, this is three and three eighths inches of three sixteenths by three quarter. 
I'm going to make sure it's against the stop the whole time and just drive it down until it's in bottom. Should have cleaned my weld up a little bit more. I did not. And then you've got your staple form, your, your first step. You take the whole thing, you bring it up to heat, you take your element, make sure that it's centered properly. Then you're going to gradually bring your collar stock down and around. I took the side that was a little long and I did it second so that it was snug in to an already established um, uh, set from the first the first set. And it, it ended up being pretty close to the middle. Now, one of the things about, about doing collaring is that when you apply it hot, no, not in the first place, you should have a nice tight fit without a gap in between the two ends where you have your closure. But because it's hot, then you're going to have thermal contraction. So it's actually going to contract um, a small fraction of an inch onto your workpiece. And it's going to actually have a, 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 a little bit of a shrink fit on there. So you won't have any wobbling at all. For incising, you want to do the incising prior to cutting your stock off. Um, if you're, if you're, I, I used a, a, a handled um, hot, a top hot cut, a top tool hot cut. If you're eyeballing it, you want to reference off of the edge of the tool. That's this edge. So you can see I'm kind of tilting at an angle so I can see the edge of my, my cutting edge and I don't have the, the tool in the way and, and blocking my vision of where I'm referencing it off of the bar. And then you're going to, to reference that from the edge to the edge of the tool. So in this case, I want to go in thirds. So um, each increment is a quarter of an inch and I want to eyeball a quarter of an inch and then eyeball another quarter of an inch over. And I want to basically walk it down until I have a good incised line. You can mark it out cold if that's a little bit um, easier for, for you to do, if you don't have as much experience doing hot work, you can always set up, you know, different sorts of jigs and things like that. Um, you can always also, if you, uh, if you wanna scribe a line in the first place, um, a, a handy way to do that is to take a, uh, an open end wrench. In this case, it would be a quarter of an inch uh, open end wrench. And you just, um, you let one edge of the open end wrench hang over the edge and the other one will scribe a line and you do that from each edge and now you've got a scribe line that you can follow. Um, you're gonna mark it deeply enough uh, to reference your, your tool when it comes out hot. So if you mark out cold, make sure that you, your tool can drop down into that groove and you're not trying to find it once you have scale on there and a lot of heat. So that when you do um, take a run hot, it tracks in your cold marking out. I do everything hot because I, I just work that way as a farrier, but, um, but you wanna make sure that you've got enough to find in the fire when you're done. And then you wanna incise past the, the measurement that you want. In this case, I did a, a beveled closure on this. So I need to have enough stock to, to account for the, the bevel on both sides and then the total um, length of stock. So in that case, you know, three and three and three eighths is what we figured. I would give myself another, you know, quarter for each bevel. So, you know, I would, I would just sort of roughly guess somewhere around four inches um, just to give myself a little bit more than I need that has the incise lines. I don't want to come back and try to have to incise this after I'm already starting to cut collaring stock off. So here's some, uh, some pictures of that. Now, in this case, you can see, let me go back actually, you can see this line wanders a little bit towards the middle. And in the next frame, I'm actually angling the tool in the direction of the edge because I can steer my, my line around a little bit, even if it wanders a little bit. If you're being careful, you can push, you can angle your, your, uh, your, your hot cut back and forth to be able to straighten your line out.
Then you're going to bevel the the end. Obviously, it's you can't see the stock very well, but what I'm looking for in this picture is the angle of my excuse me my hammer here to bevel the end. Excuse me. And then you're uh, then you're going to flip it over, and you're gonna you're gonna measure out from the the beveled end. You're going to take your measurement, and then you're going to hot cut from there. And it wouldn't hurt to have it just a you know a sixteenth of an inch long and be able to clean that up to the exact length um, with a file before you do your closure. Then you're going to take that and you're going to put the whole arrangement in in the scrolling vise just as we had the last time and use your set hammer to um, to do your closure. And then when you do a beveled uh, closure like this, a, uh, I guess beveled is the, the word for some reason. <laughs> it seems like there's a more appropriate word, but I'm blanking on it. Um, you want to make sure that you start with this bevel, the one that's going, the, the flat edge here needs to be flat on your stock. You go the other way around and you've messed up and you got to start over again because uh, you did it backwards. So here we're going to incise some material. I just uh, grip that between my legs. I'm going to start. You can see I'm angling it so I can see where I, where I am, a quarter of an inch from the edge. I'm going to start on the ends, give myself a mark. And then I'm going to uh, just walk it back. I'm going to lift the heel and drag so that the toe stays in the, um, in the groove and the heel can 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 clear the last cut and then before each strike I just drop it back down um, to be um, flushed with the surface and just walk that down until I've got it where I where I want. Um, again if you don't if you're not comfortable with this hot you know doing it cold is just fine and then you can see how it's easy to lose your mark uh, once you've got some heat in it, sometimes the um, uh, radiant heat and the incandescent light coming off of that um, can make it hard to be able to see. Now you're going to see I'm going to tilt this to the side here and I'm going to steer that line um, since it wobbled a little bit. And I can steer it if the line's still shallow and, uh, and then I can deepen it with the tool straight up and down afterwards. Um, because once I've corrected it, then it's going to drop right down and, um, and it'll straighten right out. So after that, you're going to put a, a short taper, keep the stock completely flat on, on your anvil so that you can control the angle of your taper. I made a little bit of correction in the width because I did get a little bit of extra width on the taper. About a 45 degree angle is just right. Now I'm gonna measure back um, from the end, the three and, and I almost did two and three eighths, but the three and three eighths. Now you could do that with, you know, soapstone or a silver marker or whatever. You'll notice that I am angling the hot cut so that I get a cut that is um, straight on this edge and 45 on this edge. And once I'm most of the way through, I'm going to use the edge of the anvil on a sharp edge as a shear to have a controlled cut that does not send my hot cut piece away from, you know, sailing across my shop or into any areas that doesn't need to be. I like to just do a control cut where I can wring the, the stock off and it doesn't go flying across the then you do the same thing as you had, make sure you have your incised size side down and drive it into your jig and mandrel. You get your U shape or your staple shape, drop it in. It's good once you have a beveled closure um, to do a little bit of a dry run. So you know which way you're gonna put it in and which side you're gonna, uh, you're gonna hit first but this is the side that needs to be done. You can see I'm using a mallet to get it mostly closed over. And I would have had a tighter closure in there if I would have just used the set hammer from the start. And you can see on this one, I needed just a little bit more, about a 16th of an inch on there to get 
completely flush on the back. It's still a good closure, but if I was going to be real picky, I would have added just a little bit of stock. And then because it's hard to get that incising queen all the way through, while I have the opportunity, I connect my lines and just clean up my incising as I go and do a little bit of cleanup with a set hammer. And that helps a lot to, um, to tidy up your so that would be a good way to, to sort of dress up uh, a collar for the level two grill is to do the incise lines. That would be uh, one of two options that I would probably elect to do myself. The other one being this wrapped and forged uh, collar. So in this case, I'm using, um, you can see I've got some three quarter square because I'm using three eighths by three quarter. So that's gonna, that's gonna um, basically equal the, the bundle. And then I've got a little bit of a taper on the end to be able to get my collar off as I'm forging. Now, as per the, the new uh, Abana um, uh, plans, it's uh, quarter by three quarters. So you would need to have, you can take two pieces, weld them together as a mandrel and do that that way. Or if you have some half by three quarter stock, which is a little less common, you could use that for your mandrel. Um, <clears throat> You're going to cut the same measurement on um, on your collar um, stock as you had on the three sixteenths, so three and three eighths. And the reason is is because this is going to get forged down to three sixteenths inch. So technically, the length should be the same. But all the the extra that I'm going here, the reason why I upsized to quarter is just to be able to have enough extra stock to forge my corners in. It's going to go through an ugly stage. You're going to see that, um, and uh, you know you just got to when you notice it's going through an ugly stage, you got to persevere and continue until it, until it uh, gets past that ugly stage. Don't get too worried about it um, early on. So I like to, to do this with um, uh, an appropriately, uh, appropriately sized pair of tongs with a ring on the back. So I don't have my mandrel and everything, you know, uh, being problematic for me while I'm, I'm trying to, to forge. And then from there, then you're going to um, forge your corners in once you get it wrapped around. And I generally try to work on my corners before I, I go through the, the, the web here. And you can see why you need the ends to be butted because they need to have support to be able to get these two corners forged in. And I try to get the, the corners basically squared and then come through and overlap my blows to have a nice uniform um, cross section on my collar. Once you've got the collar forged in, you're gonna take a pair of scrolling tongs and open it up hot. And, and you'll see here in, uh, I think in the next frame, why it's very important to uh, to chamfer the corners of your mandrel because if this is sharp in here and then you do all that forging when you open it up you'll have a cold shut here and it'll open a big fat fissure uh, and uh, crack here in the corners as shown so you can see I'm pointing at it with my my punch here so when you have a a chamfered mandrel you'll have a little bit of a, a radius on here on the inside edge during the whole forging process so when you open it up it won't crack like that. So you can see, and I did this intentionally because that's this is a big problem area. So you can see this is without it dressed. That's a factory um, edge on that sock. And that is it with a, I would say a, a strong 16th inch um, chamfer on that edge. That's the actual working edge. After that, you open it wide enough, you're going to do a test fit, make sure that it, it's wide enough that you can uh, fit it in around your, uh, your scroll fragments. And then if you're satisfied with that, um, you can make any adjustments in this width, make sure that you're not going to come out hot and you can't get it to fit on. Then you take the whole thing back up, heat it up and apply it with a pair of bolt tongs works really well. Um, bolt tongs tend to be able to get enough grip on here to close it. So you close it with the bolt tongs first, and then from there, you can take it, transfer it over to your jig that you have in here, your, your, your collaring vise. Again, this isn't something you need to forge and have any elaborate skill set to do. You can do all of this with some angle iron and a fabricated um, vice just like this. And then you can get your closure while you still have enough heat. So 
let's see what that all looks like. This is the quarter inch stock. Um, I know this is redundant, but um, you know, it is the first step in each of it. So you just get to see it three times. And you're gonna drive it in just like we had. I think I used the first video. I, I don't think I don't think this is actually even three quarter inch stock. I think it's three sixteen. So I'm going a little low. Oh, there we go. It's the first video. So a little uh, movie magic there. But get your uh, get your little uh, staple form. You're going to bring it out hot. Take your mandrel, and this is the ugly stage. Basically, kind of put it up on a corner. Snug it down in. Put it up on a corner, and just wrap that thing around until you know until it's it's pretty much all the way around. Now you could, if you really wanted to, you could take it right over to your little scroll, um, scroll vise or your collar vise, and you could bend that um, in advance and, and, and do it that way, just like you've applied all the other collars. But this is kind of the quick and dirty way of doing it. So you get it wrapped around, you can see it ultimately, it, it cleans up, so no harm, no foul. Bring it out hot. Get it back onto your onto your mandrel. And now you're gonna work primarily on your on your corners. You can see my my blows are kind of angled in, sort of from this side and then from this side. And then I turn it and then work down as I go. And I'm trying to work an equal amount of hits every corner until I start to establish an actual corner. And that will take you a couple or few heats. So I think at this point, I probably have taken maybe two or three heats. And, and I think I've edited my, edited my video down um, to basically just show working down the edges and you know blending everything um, from corner to corner with overlapping blows. You take your finished collar, use your scrolling tongs, open it up. I like to turn it over because the cone shape tends to open it in a little bit of a twist. You take that, check it, it fits. So you bring it out, out have your pair of, I used a pair of five eighths inch um, bolt tongs. Take it while you've got some heat. Because remember, you want it to have that shrink fit. It's a little bit big for my vice. As I said, it has limited applications. You close up that gap the rest of the way and make sure everything's tight. And with the last little bit of heat, then you can set that down and finish your last little bit of your closure there. That should all be one heat. You should bring it out open, apply it, squeeze it with the, 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 the bolt tongs and transfer it to, um, to the vise all in a single heat so that it does have a differential between a cold scroll element and a hot collar so it does have a shrink fit. If you put that whole thing in the in the fire, you're, you're not gonna have that added extra security from it shrinking on because everything will heat to the same heat. It'll all have a thermal expansion and then it will all uniformly contract and uh, you might have a little bit of wo wobble in your collar. So it has to be one, choreographed um, uh, thing where you might want to do a couple of uh, rehearsals first and make sure that you're, you're comfortable with the whole process. So this is beyond the scope of what we're doing for level two, but this is what it leads to. <clears throat> Beaded collars, this is more advanced. I'm showing this because I want you to understand what kind of tool commitment you have when you do this. You can see these are three, uh, three different beaded collars. This is a this is a quarter inch bead like Mark does for the level three. I use a half inch bead. And then this is the old level two beaded collar swage. You can see this is kind of what the, what the beaded collar looks like. It's three lobes on the old plans that you would get from John McClellan. But you need to understand you have a big commitment in making all of the tooling to match. And that's why I wouldn't recommend that you, uh, you, you do this until you have more experience and it's more appropriate to do at level three. So, you know, um, it kind of gives you an idea of the trajectory and where you're going to be going, but not only do you have to have the swages, but then you have to have top tools to protect your bead when you're doing your closures and you have to have matching um, scrolling um, or collaring vices and jigs 
So the commitment for this is much greater. The level of um, aptitude and, and, and experience you have is, is very much greater. Um, but it's nice to know where you're going. And uh, when you get to this level, it's really cool to have that um, ability to have some uh, extra expression on your pieces, you know, some room for artistic expression and, and different designs and compositions. So anyway, um, none of this is actually covered. And this is, by the way, not even all of the tools. <laughs> you know, this is just the basic tools just to make and apply the stock, but it doesn't show all of them necessary for the application of the collar and everything. So, um, so anyway, um, that is why I would discourage you, even if you happen to see the um, the old plans from John McClellan, and it shows this this triple beaded collar, and that is what I did on my level two when I did my level two about ten years ago. I did that because that's what's, what was on the plans. But um, in talking to John, he even at the time that he made up those plans, he was only expecting people to do an incised collar. So I did it because that's what was shown, but it was a lot harder than it had it to be. And at, you know, for me at level two, I mean, it was, it was very challenging and very intimidating. I'm glad I did it, but I wouldn't recommend it. Anyway, um, so that concludes the collaring for level two. And I'm going to stop sharing and open that for questions for anybody that might have any questions about collaring. Thank you for the uh, warning about the tool commitment. Sometimes that, that that's not apparent until you're most of the way there. You're welcome. Yeah, that's my civic duty <laughs> to let you know, uh, you know, hey, do it if you, you know, whatever makes you happy, but be warned. Everybody feel free to turn on the cameras and the mics and uh, chime in with any questions you might have. I'd like to know about the, the collaring bites. Do you have a couple of sizes of that? It's a really uh, neat little feature. I intend to make um, a few more of them. I just have it for what I need for demonstrations for, for the level two. And I basically made it when I knew I was gonna be demonstrating for level two, uh, I made it for that particular purpose. All the other ones that I have, are all fabricated, but they're all for level three, really. Um, having said all that, I definitely, um, I like them well enough that I'm gonna make them in different sizes. And also, if you look at, I think it's, you know, also in chapter 16 of Mark's third book, he has, um, you know, how to make those. And um, they, they don't quite fit the vices that I have. So I'm gonna have to take that as a starting point and then, you know, do some modifications for where, the jaws set on my vice, make sure that it matches up and then also for different collaring sizes and types. So I definitely have plans to do it. I think it's well worth making them personally. Great. Um, it's really in the chat. Um, I see Russ, your, uh, your mic is muted. Still, still can't. Can't hear you. <laughs> maybe, maybe type in the chat if it's. Sometimes your computer mic is uh, turned off. The volume's all the way down. Or, yeah not using headsets, but I do it all the time where I'll turn off my inline uh, toggle on my headset. So obviously a different problem, but. I have a question, John. Yeah. Do you, have, do you teach any workshops anymore? Yeah. Yeah. I I'm just, yeah, I'm just setting up a new shop and 
I'm just, I have my entire forging area is basically set and ready to go, but I have all of my um, workstations for students. I, that's the next thing that I've got to, I've got to set up. So should be pretty soon. I'm expecting this spring, I should be able to get everything else set up and then I'll have everything permanently housed and ready to go. Uh, Russ's question is a formula for the square collar is the same as for the other collars? Yeah, um, in in the case of the uh, of this particular square collar, uh, the, uh, the it's it's assumed that you're forging it down to three sixteenths. So the the um, the, me the the measurement is the same for the length. But if you wanted to do it in a way that you um, you wanted to keep you know maintain a quarter of an inch thickness, I think in this case it would look very bulky then what you would do is, you know, you take your, um, you take your perimeter and then imagine, you know, if you have your perimeter with all the pieces with, and the corners are missing, you basically have to multiply instead of 2.5, you'd have to have somewhere in the neighborhood of four. So imagine there's a little square of stock that needs to fit into each of those corners and each one of them would be you know, the thickness by the thickness to go all the way from corner to corner. So you would have to account for um, for that um, perimeter plus stock times four to account for the extra stock for the for the corners. Good, good question. Yeah. And then you'd have to be very careful about um, about not um, thinning it. And you might even want to start with uh, um, with a you know, a different approach. Uh, you might, you know, in that case, it gets a little tricky. Um, this is kind of something you have to do in the level three um, collar. You might have to actually, um, I'll draw a little, uh, you might have to draw your stock out from larger stock and you'd have to, let me see if I can get a, uh, you'd have to forge in little humps for the corners because otherwise when you're, and then you'd have to put your bends at each of these humps because if you don't, you don't have the material there when you either are gonna over forge it and it's gonna be, it's not gonna fit your mandrel anymore um, or you're gonna have some sort of other problem, you know, with, with getting it in. So that's why in this case, that, that can show you the rationale for why we're going from quarter to three sixteenths. Then you don't have to have that additional stock in the corners. Would that have to be oh. a very precise? Um, yeah. Where you put those bumps to yeah, get it, that or would you have some wiggle room? It has to be pretty much dead on where the corner is gonna be. And Mark, I, I know, um, at some point we'll have a, a write-up of, of that. Um, I know you could, he might have some of that up. I, I haven't checked with him recently, but I think he was um, gonna publish some of that on the level three collar. That one has a bead though, you know? So it's, it's not apples and apples, it's a beaded collar, but it shows you kind of the rationale for doing that. It's a different approach. Um, you know, like if you're going to do an upset corner, you either have to have the whole piece oversized and then push it in and it, and each edge gets shorter as you go, as you're upsetting, or you need to start by having that collar forged in in advance, like I just showed you. And then you've got the extra material there. So when you make your bend, then you have something to basically just forge the surface out to, you know, to, to flush. So there's, there's multiple ways to do it all, but it just depends on how deeply down the rabbit hole you want to go. When you're, um, oh, sorry. Sorry. Right. No, Ryan, go ahead. Um, just with your, um, the formula, it's uh, perimeter plus stock thickness. Do you add a little extra for the curve of the scroll that you're going around, or is it just like flat stock? Um, oh, yeah. You mean because, because just, yeah, it could be a little bit wider, right? Scroll, yeah. yeah. Um, it's usually not such a great addition of of stock that it's really much of a of an issue okay you know when you're um you know i think that might be where the i mean in theory it should 
it should be somewhere around um, the perimeter plus two, but the perimeter plus 2.5 is probably accounting for, for yeah. that, you know, you, you find that you end up just a little short if you just go times two. So, you know, it's one of those situations where the math makes sense and then the application of it, it doesn't always line up with the, the theory you've got to, that's why you want to start with the theory, do a test and just take your observations from that and make an adjustment. You know, because the number doesn't matter as long as you, you know, as long as you've got enough of an observation to know that it's the right amount. It doesn't matter how you arrive there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah, good, great questions. Um, what, <clears throat> excuse me. So, um, on the square collar, when you're when you're forging out those corners square mm -hmm. and then blending it in, do you get a lot of stretch? on the width so like going beyond parent stock size and if you dress that back in will that really mess with the collar so you know if i'm forging this the, the material has got to go somewhere into the corner but if it's coming out on the edges too you you know you would, you would think that it would and uh it just turns out that it doesn't <laughs> okay <laughs> you know i mean i was worried about that too i thought you know, I'm going to, I'm going to be using a three quarter inch uh, square mandrel and it's going to be like a seven eighths inch collar by the time I'm done. Right. Is what right. I would think. Um, it just doesn't, it doesn't end up happening. Um, you know, one thing though, is like, as you're, as you're forging the call, you know, if it does get a little big, if you're upsetting really well, you should be able to just drive right down that column of stock. And, you know, you haven't really gotten to a, a ratio of width to, to thickness to width you know, uh, where it's, it's, it's gonna get too squirrely on you. It's, it still will sort of pack down. So it, it just doesn't seem to be a, a problem. I could, it is a problem once you start getting in more elaborate, um, collars. Like when I did the upset corner on the beaded collar for the level three, yeah, that was, that was an issue. It's real hard to keep that thing fit. And, uh, you know, it's real easy for it to get larger than the size of the stock. So the way that I went about doing that myself is I undersized my mandrel by an eighth of an inch on each edge and, or like not on each edge, about eighth of an inch on one edge and about a 16th on the other, because, you know, the long edge um, is affected more than the short edge. It has more material there to, to stretch. But um, so I started with one that um, I can't remember what the total thickness of the bundle is um i could it, it doesn't matter but I, I i just took that and i just undersized my first mandrel and then once i got my rough forging in then i switched once it started to stretch a little bit and i finished it out on the on the true size gotcha great thanks yeah you're welcome uh -huh. Well, if nobody has any other questions, um, we're going to get this is all being recorded. And uh, as soon as we have it downloaded and up to the correct place, either on YouTube or as a Google document, um, we'll forward it out to everybody who signed up for class. Um, a couple of people missed Carol and, and Beatrice didn't make it. But um, and if anybody has any questions, you just reach out to me by the email. Um, happy to figure out whatever we need to do to get you the, the video of it as well. And thank you, John. That was great. That was really oh, you're welcome. That that the upset square corner was really impressive. Thanks. Yeah, it's a it's a fun one, and I would you know I would encourage you guys to try them all. You know, it's just more in the toolbox, so just more that you can use later. Great. Um, anything? Any last questions from anybody? Otherwise, we'll uh, we'll uh, get the link out to you within the next couple of days. Do have a quick question for John about other, not the collaring stuff since you're on the education committee, but I don't know if anybody else wants to be bored by my random questions. Um, but uh, it's about mentoring and getting a, you know, somebody to do evaluations and things like that. So I don't mind. I mean, um, so being in Connecticut, obviously I'm not near any of you. Um, and uh, I was looking on the site for somebody to do evaluations because I'm, I've been forging for a while, but um, I was going to go through all one, two, and three. I haven't done any of it yet. And uh, there's nobody on the site in New England at all that's listed as a as an evaluator or instructor or whatever the term is. 
Um, the closest was uh, Ellen in, in Delaware. And I, she was like, nah, I'm, I'm too far away. So, um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'm kind of lost as to if there's uh, somebody I could contact that would be willing to do it. I don't know how to do it virtually. I'd mail them my stuff. I don't know. Um, because obviously there's no one in New England. Yeah, there's a few. There are a few uh, people in um, Maine, I think. Um, okay. Beth Holmberg, who was uh, here in California and taught this for many years, is okay. in Maine. And um, uh, it's, uh, what's his last? It's uh, Sam Samuel, um, like Petrakis or something. It's, I think his, uh, his IG handle is Scald something. Paracus, okay. Samuel Paracus. Okay. And um, he just did his, and he's also, I think, in New England. Um, and uh, I know in uh, Connecticut, um, Bob Valentine is in Connecticut, but I understand that Connecticut has some mountains in there that it can be close as the crow flies, but it could be like four hours drive. You know, <laughs> I talked to him about that, and uh, he was talking about hosting something. And okay. The way that we've been doing it um, through Abana is, you know, we, I, I, I still, I'm still saying we, even though I'm not on the Abana board anymore, but, um, right. you know, they have some, some funds to be able to put together national curriculum instructor training uh, courses. So you could reach out to, I think, Stuart Shirley now is the education committee um, chairman um, for Abana, and you could reach out to him. And if you could get enough people and a venue, there might be some money to put together something in that in that area um gotcha. so now maybe not because they just did something in maine and they're trying not to you know double up in mm -hmm. like regionally but you i would still um i would still talk to him about that and i do know that um Sam, or bob valentine in connecticut he's in goshen's i think yep um you know he had expressed interest in in hosting something so you know i would go mm -hmm. that route you can always reach out to me you can always reach out to uh, the folks on the on the committee and and see what's going on. And in, in the interim, if you can't connect with any of those folks that already have, um, you know, done this up in the New England area, um, yep. you could always uh, contact the education committee and you could send um, pictures of all sides and angles uh, gotcha. for, a, for a online review up until you do the level three national curriculum instructor. And that's, you know, that's if you want to teach level three and, and that has sure. to have people in, in person, but that's a different matter. So you know, I think you'd be fine with level two, just having it evaluated online. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Hey, John, I just want to step in here. Greg touched on something I was always wondering about because I'm, I'm kind of doing things fast backwards and I started <laughs> tackling the level three grill. I started, I took the, oh, the CBA yeah. course last winter. Okay. And, uh, yeah, well, uh, the way it gets marked or judged, can it be done through photos or like, has it, does it have to be in person? Yeah, it up until, like I said, up until the uh, national curriculum instructor, that's the highest okay. level. Yeah. That's people yeah. teaching level three at a national level. Yeah. We're not requiring people to do in person. Okay. It's better if you can. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, right now, Abana realizes that since they don't have the, the coverage, and it's yeah. not regionally accessible to everybody. They're trying to make sure that there is coverage by getting people like, you know, you and Greg that are interested in doing this in yeah. your region. I don't, I don't know anybody in Canada that does this. Oh yeah. Um, you know, actually uh, front step forge. What's yeah, his yeah. name? Sean Cunningham. Sean Cunningham. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. He, he started it. Um, oh. So I don't know how far along he was, but he took the very first, um it was like by invitation only abana class and started oh, um started the process so i would reach out to sean and yeah if you you know if you can do buddy system if you guys you know get just a core group of people in your area that you can start it uh encourage each other and help each other through that level three and then from there yeah. you can be available to help people in your area that's really how this sort of thing happens and how it grows okay. over time yeah. so reach out to sure. sean yeah, will do. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. We'll have an Abana chapter in no time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's encouraging to see that people everywhere are doing this. You know, when I started, yeah. even in California, there were very few people doing it. So seeing people from Connecticut and Canada and Montana and all over, it's, it's really awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have one of the 
old uh, grill forms from when we did the Delaware hammer in uh, Abana, however many years ago that was. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was like, I've just been sitting there and I was like, oh, well, maybe I'll give it a shot. And then pulled up the new one. I was like, oh, wait, none of this matches any of that random paperwork I had from years ago. <laughs> we're, we're cleaning it up. You know, yeah. I mean, a lot of what we're doing right now is is coming from, you know, my personal experience doing this, you know, and mm -hmm. then I took that personal experience and that kind of informed me for how I was doing things with Abana. But there's been a lot of talk back and forth between CBA and Abana and making sure that we're keeping things, you know, with a good amount of continuity. There's not a lot of discrepancies and and um, that sort of thing. So, you know, it's it's better to look at the updated stuff. And also we have videos like this and all the stuff right. that's being posted to Mark's and Mark's pages, CBA pages, Abana pages. So the support's definitely there and it, it just helps to just get the updated stuff. Yeah, I know. That's great. Thanks. Yeah, we're, we're trying to make it better than it has been. Yeah, because I don't think at the Delaware one, people didn't even know the curriculum was an op, like existed. It was something in the teaching tent. And they're like, oh, by the way, there's this thing. And everyone's like, oh, all right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's a lot more than probably there was at, at Delaware. So, yeah. 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 Jack, I saw you had your hand up for a second. Did you? Your uh, your mic's off though. No, no, I was probably scratching my head or something. Mm. I know. Just to say thanks, John. It was really a nice, uh, oh, nice yeah. uh, Zoom session. Oh, you're welcome. Thank very, you. Very, Appreciate very, it. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you much. Yeah, and they're not here, but thanks to Greg Hudgens and Victoria because they did all the filming. So that was uh, they they made it look good. So. Alrighty. Well, I'm gonna stop the recording. And uh, to do.